Thank you. Well, actually, this is the first time giving the awesome talk on Programmer's uh, Guide to Western Music, so hopefully it's, it's awesome. Um, I know there's a very sort of thirsty audience out there. I can feel the sort of hot breath waiting for those beverages. So I'll uh, try, to, try to keep this quick, and it'll be a nice sort of gentle talk this afternoon to finish us off. It was interesting, actually. So I was in um, Raquel's keynote earlier on today, and I had this amazing flashback that was me when I was 10 years old. So uh, when I was 10, a touring sort of computer classroom came to our school. And at that stage, our primary school didn't have any computers for students to use. So this, this touring group would sort of go around the country and they'd set up, and for the couple of weeks they were there, you'd have a couple of your maths classes, for example, in this computer lab. And I really was remembering vividly today, of course, I'm sure some of you are seeing where this is going, using Logo, a programming language. Uh, Seymour Papert, Mindstorms, that whole kind of uh, tradition that's carried on in the lifelong kindergarten and all this sort of work out of MIT. And, you know, the turtle uh, with the pen up, pen down, drawing spirals and triangles and squares, and using this programming language interactively to build sort of mathematical models, for want of a better word, that could help me as a 10-year-old better understand the kind of uh, basic um, geometry that I was learning at school at that stage. And it was just uh, it was very cool to kind of get caught up on that today. I was just sort of sitting there going, wow, this is, this is turtle graphics, you know, this is, uh, so, it was, so it's kind of cool. So uh, when Ian asked me what I wanted to talk about here today, I thought, gee, wouldn't it be cool if I could live code a history of Western music? If I could kind of cover a history of Western music in code, basically in the same way that with this original logo live programming environment, I was doing geometry, if I could do the same thing with music and actually cover sort of Western music, sort of the last 1,000, 1,500 years. And so I suggested this to Ian, and Ian said, great. And then I went, shit. Um, so um, I'm, I'm sort of stuck to my guns, and I'm going to give this a, a go today. Um, what, what really is going to end up happening is I'm, very go I'm going to be cherry picking things. I'm afraid that's just the way it's going to have to be. Um, so, but I will try and go sort of somewhat chronologically through time. I'm not going to be really sort of... Uh, overly concerned about being historically accurate in every context. Um, it's going to be a sort of a rough guide. The other thing is I'm, I'm very much hoping that as you're listening to these things, and I'll talk about them a little bit as we go along, but as you're listening to them, one of the big points of today is I hope that you'll start to see sort of some of the structure and function of Western music and where that's come from and sort of where that's, uh, how it's changed really over the, the, the last millennia. So uh, a couple of housekeeping things to start with. I have my uh, one slide for you today. Um, so we just have to get this out of the way. This is basically a diatonic Western scale. Uh, and as you can see, the bit that we're concentrating on at the moment is the fact that it's a set. So this is a seven element set. You can see that there's seven integers in there. It's 0, 2, 3, 5, 7, 8, and 10. And this is uh, called an Aeolian scale or a natural minor scale. And the thing I want you, the, there's two things really we need to keep in mind uh, in the context of today. One, that, it's, that it forms this set. The second thing is sometimes I'll talk about scale degrees today. The degrees I'm talking about are then these Roman numerals along the bottom, which is basically just enumerating what uh, element of the set it is. But the other thing to keep in mind is that this set is modulo 12 and of course stretches up uh, through the frequency range, because uh, as you can imagine, a tuba and a flute aren't playing at the same pitch, so, but they can be playing the same note in the same scale. So when you see the things that I'm working on today, you have to keep in mind things like zero in this context can be 12, 24, 36, 48, 60. So it's basically modulo 12, okay? And that's what makes it uh, part of this scale system. So the same would be true of 62, 50, 38, 26, 14 would be 2, which is the second element. But for example, a number 61 wouldn't fall in this scale. So in the context of this scale, that would be illegal. 
So the reason why I'm introducing this is you're just going to see this all the way through today. And just keep in mind that a value of about uh, 20 is sort of the far left-hand end of the piano keyboard, and a value of about 108 is sort of the far right-hand end of the piano keyboard. That's just to give you a bit of context. Okay. So I have one more bit of housekeeping to get out of the way, and that's uh, some code now. Uh, the other thing I'm going to be using a lot of today is a design pattern called a temporal recursion. So I'm just going to show you how that works. So if I define a function, we'll just call that, you know, my func, um, and uh, it doesn't need to take any arguments, and I'm going to now just play a note here. So now if I call my func, we hear that. Uh, you all hear that out there when I've, when I've called that? You're hearing the piano sound? Yes, yay, excellent, excellent. Okay, so this is effectively calling the function, of course, and then the, the, the function is then calling this play note, which is sounding this piano that we're listening to. So um, I'll, I've just turned up a little bit here. Um, so what we can do is we can actually call back asynchronously to this function. So we can basically say what we'd like to do is uh, call back to my func at some point in time. So if we used now, for example, then it's going to effectively play that function immediately. But we could uh, add a longer duration to now for a second. We just say now plus one second and I've evaluated it, and then it runs the code one second later. So the design pattern that I'm going to be using a lot of today, which is why we're having this little discussion, is that we combine these two things. And effectively, we make a recursive function that recurses through time. So rather than being a recursion that calls itself back as quickly as possible and goes into this kind of tight loop, where playing, the, the function will call itself, it will do something in the body of the function, and then it will schedule itself into the future, at which point it will be called again, it will do something in the body, schedule itself into the future, etc. And this is how all of these uh, sort of models, these musical models that I'm going to be working at, uh, on today uh, are, are designed. Generally speaking, of course, we're going to pass changes to arguments around each time through the recursion to do something interesting. So let me just start with the first model. So our first model is going to be sort of roughly around the year 1000 AD. So, you know, we're thinking, you know, uh, monks and cathedrals and uh, brown robes. You know, if you kind of have a picture of uh, Blackadder season one in your head, that's, that's kind of what we're talking about. So I'm just going to start by defining a scale. As I said, we're going to be working with these scales a lot today. So this scale is going to be this... Aeolian scale that we talked about before. I'll just print it out the bottom just to, uh, just to show you what's there. And now I'm going to define a boilerplate temporal recursion. This is exactly the same as the temporal recursion that I showed you just before, except we're now using a metronome uh, to help with the timing of this, to make it uh, more musically uh, friendly. So I'm going to call this model one, and uh, we're going to uh, play a pitch, and we'll leave this at 80, uh, the duration is fine, and then I'm going to pass in an instrument, which is the timbre of the sound we want, and a pan, which is basically sort of where in the stereo field between left and right we would like this to sound. So down here, I'm now going to have to pass in pitch and instrument and pan into our function so that we can actually uh, do something with those values. And I'm also going to pass a step, and this is how we're going to walk through the scale. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to call a function PC relative. I'm going to use this a lot today, and basically it's just a way of stepping up and down through a scale depending on what pitch you've started at. So we can just pass in pitch, and I'm going to say minus one because we're just going to fall down through the scale and the scale that we want. Okay, we need a step. I'm just going to increment steps so we know where we are in the scale. I'm going to pass the pan around. I'm going to pass the, uh, whoops, the instrument around, I should say, the pan around. And the duration, I mean, just like Artbot, of course, we have to have some randomness. Uh, all good computational art has to have randomness. So uh, I'm just going to randomly choose either three beats, four beats, or five beats for this function. <laughs> 
Now, just finally, I'm going to also put in a little modulo here. So we'll say, I'm checking the step, modulo eight, and I'm just really checking to see when the scale gets to the bottom. And then we're going to leap back up, but not quite to the top. And then we'll fall again, leap up, fall again, leap up. So it's a very simple model that we're talking about here. Okay, and we evaluate this model and now we're ready to go, but we need to seed it to start it running. So we're going to give it a starting pitch. We need to give it a step. This is going to, we'll just start at zero. The instrument we're gonna play on, I'm gonna use a violin here, a violin sound that we'll be listening to. Uh, the pan, I'm actually gonna pan it left. It might be a bit hard to hear in here because we've sort of got <laughs> stereo speakers all the way across. Um, and what are we up to? Finally, we need a duration and we're ready to go. So here's our first model thinking, you know, Blackadder season one here. And we're just gonna start off with uh, one violin. I'm also gonna turn the volume down to start with. Okay, now it's an interesting question how we stop this, right? Now that we've got it running, how do we stop the damn thing? Well, it's pretty simple, of course. All we need to do is actually just not recurse, right? So we can do if false. Thank you. So we just put an if false in. This isn't gonna be the prettiest tie in, but it gives the, the, uh, the idea. And we're just gonna drop out now because the next time round, it won't call back to itself in the future and it'll just fall through. And of course, all those parts were running at their own rate. So this is a, a, a cooperative concurrency that we have running here because all of these are running at their own rate. Now, one of the things that I'm hoping that you sort of picked up while you were listening to that is that once we have these harmonies moving around and we have all of these parts running at the same time, we have these kind of dissonances and resolutions as the notes sort of come into conflict with each other. Um, and the second model then is another simple model, but it's a big step. We're talking 500 years forward now, so we're jumping really to sort of Blackadder series two almost. Um, we're, we're sort of moving from brown wigs, uh, brown, brown robes to wigs, I guess. Uh, and uh, so, but with this second model, I'm going to have a look more directly at modeling uh, block harmony. Now one of the reasons why this became so important was because composers were starting to think about this. They'd been up until that time. One of the things that may uh, be surprising to you is that as far as we can tell, there was no polyphonic music written before about 600 or 700 AD. So from antiquity, we really only have a few snippets of information. Actually, this is an amazing fact as well. There are only something like 50 shards of information from, from all of antiquity that have any kind of uh, notated music on them. So we actually have very little idea about what music really sounded like in that period. Um, but, I, I digress, um, the, uh, the chord, the harmonies then, all of a sudden composers had to think vertically as well as horizontally. So they're used to thinking in this sort of horizontal fashion, now they have to start thinking vertically. So the chords we're gonna have a look at now are vertical. So here we go, model two, this is uh, Blackadder season two, kind of thinking about Baldrick and... Uh, so here we go. Um, Model two. Now with this one, because we're working vertically now, I want all the notes vertically to sound at the same time. So we're just going to use a map. 
Uh, I'm going to pass the pitch around. Uh, we're going to make a chord here. The way this chord works is that I'm going to give it a lower bound for the bottom of the range, an upper bound for the top of the range, the number of notes that I want to be generated from this range, and then most import importantly, and again, this comes back to the scales we were talking about earlier, the degree of the scale that this chord is going to be built upon. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass a degree in here. I'm also just going to play P um, and we'll choose to play this on an organ. And then I'm going to pass degree around our function here. Again, we're going to use uh, Artbot's random, very important random. Um, and then finally, we're going to use uh, a, a simple uh, um, Markov matrix, basically, so that we can have a probability relationship about how these chords move. And the whole point of doing this is that over the last thousand years of music theory, we've developed as a culture an identity about how those chords should interact with each other. Uh, and that's actually quite a fixed, of course, it always gets broken in subtle ways, but 95% of the time, it's actually quite fixed. So we can do that using uh, an associative list, um, which is basically just a dictionary, really. Um, and I'm going to set this off with a very simple... <laughs> hey, come on. <laughs> OK. So we need to seed it. And of course, basically the way this is going to work is if we get a 1, we're going to get a 5. And then the next time around, it's going to be a 5. So we get a 1. So we're just going to flip-flop backwards and forwards. OK, I'll uh, start this off, model two, model two. OK, now I'm going to leave it playing. I'll turn it up again in a second. And I'm going to start adding additional chords to the matrix, and hopefully you'll be able to hear those chords when they come in. Of course, it's still probabilistic, or at least it will be when we have more than one value option. So uh, just keep an eye out for these new chords as I enter them in. might like uh, five to go to six, for example. We could start with six and we could pass six to four. Now, one of the cool things about modeling computationally, of course, is that we gain leverage through our abstraction, right? So at the moment, this is all working in a major key. So I'm going to change it over to a minor key, and you'll have a listen to that change. And now I'll flick it back to the major again. So the abstractions that we're adding help us to learn about how this works in the real world. So the same as Raquel's working with robots, this is also physical. We're listening to this as it reverberates in the space, and we're learning about music by changing it and manipulating it computationally and hearing how that changes the way it works, how its structure and function are formed. So uh, let me just uh, stop Model 2. This is the dirty hack way to stop a temporal recursion. You define Model 2 to be null, and it crashes. <laughs> it's ugly, but it's very fast. Um, OK, so I'm now going to just copy Model 2. Um, we're moving again forward in time. This is pretty much actually black out of three, so we're now top hat. Um, and uh, we're sort of looking at, uh, around about sort of mid-1700s now, or a, a actually even a little bit later than that, uh, around sort of just the turn, 17 to 1800s. So, uh, need to rename this, model two, three, three. three. And um, I'm just going to start by 
copying this up the top here. Um, and I'm going to make this fixed now. So it's actually working from a fixed position. Uh, you'll hear what that means in a second. And I'm going to change across to a piano. We're going to play the chord. And I'm also going to pass in a range because I'm going to now break up the chord. Everything we've been listening to so far has been this boom, boom, boom block chords. We're now going to use an arpeggio, which basically means broken chord. So it's going to play each note of the uh, chord independently. So I need to pass that round, uh, add that as an offset. Uh, we're pretty good to go, but I'm just going to also, it's a little bit uh, full on on the reverb at the moment. <laughs> Turn that down a bit. Okay, I think we're good to go. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, Blackadder season three coming up. Here we go. Oh, actually, one more thing. Make that uh, duration of three. So this is this arpeggio, it's now just separating out the notes of the chord. I'm just going to um, add a little more harmonic complexity to our matrix, uh, and you'll understand why in a second. Now what I'd like to do is everything we've been doing to this, till this sort of point has been quite random um, and I'd like to now try and actually produce a melody and the way that we're going to tackle that problem is by using very little uh, melodic cells, usually about two or three notes in duration and they'll have a pitch and they'll have a rhythm and what we're going to do is we're going to combine these cells together so that they produce a melody which is going to be driven by the chord. So what's going to happen is, uh, first of all, I'll define, uh, let's say, C1 for cell 1. And I'm actually not going to change pitch. It's going to play the same pitch twice, but it's going to play with a rhythm. So let me just add, whoops, this here. So this is C1. And then down here, I'm now going to play this cell. Uh, and we need lead. Oops. Lead. Um, what else do we need? Uh, we need the starting pitch. So uh, first of all, we're going to randomly choose one of the notes from the chord to start on. But I'm also going to push it up one octave by adding 12 so that it sits above the lower hand. It's kind of like we have the left hand playing and now the right hand's going to play above it. Um, and then we just need C1, which is our cell one, and we need to pass the scale around because of course everything we're doing is based on set theory, basically. So here we go, uh, we'll um, punch this in now. Okay, so this is just playing this little cell, the first one we've added. Things get a bit more interesting though if we start adding some additional cells. So let me come over here, we'll punch in a cell two. And then of course we can just uh, randomly choose between the two cells. That's then chosen the second of the cell quite a few times in a row. Uh, let's add a third cell here. We'll add it to our list of random cells. Okay, now finally, a really easy little trick is that we can then use some simple transformations to change the cells that we've already got. So I'm actually just going to do a really simple one here, and we're just going to say that it's either going to be the identity function 
or else it's going to be an inversion. Uh, so we just multiply to invert, and we're just going to randomly choose between those two transformations. And so now the pictures will be inverted or not, depending on whether the identity or the inversion transformation is chosen. Okay, let me... Uh, close that off. So, uh, historically now, um, we're starting to move towards the uh, start or the very end of the, the uh, 19th century, the start of the 20th century. And this is kind of the Impressionist period. So, a little bit before Blackadder Season 4. Um, and uh, I'm going to start by uh, copying the model down here. We'll, uh, we'll jump to, this is now going to become Model 4. Model 4, 4, 4. Uh, we're not going to use the degrees anymore, and this is why we're looking at this example. Because what started to happen in this period, and this is pr probably the best example of this, is Claude Debussy, and he starts working purely with scales that are not from the diatonic tradition. So he's sort of trying to push away from this, and he's starting to work with things like the pentatonic scale and the whole tone scale. So we're going to do a very similar example to the last one, but we're actually going to move away from diatonic harmony, and you'll, you'll get a sense of, of what this all sounds like. So again, I'm just going to make a change here to stop it being fixed, and I'm going to randomly choose again from the sort of base of the range, randomly choose from the top of the range, Oops. Uh, we're going to choose a few more notes. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to randomly choose, oops, PC scale. And we're going to randomly choose between two. different scale patterns. So we're going to randomly choose between these scales. I've just got two pentatonics to give it more weight, basically. Uh, and that's all good. We're not going to use our melody anymore. Uh, we need a few more notes and ready to go. Okay, oh, actually, one important thing. We're impressionists, so, you know, meat of life. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a cosine here to change the tempo. So all of the tempos we've been working with are quite fixed, and that's quite symbolic of a lot of those periods, but this now is just going to shift all over the place, and you'll hear that in the piano part, because it's going to be quite aggressive. Okay, so here's our Model 4. Oh, it's because we don't want the degree anymore. We're sort of thinking Monet, Renoir, it's, it's this kind of period. The, the important thing from a, a musically historical perspective is this movement away from really what at that stage was a millennia uh, based around the diatonic system. And this then takes us to the point where we really break away from what had previously been the diatonic system. And this happens after the end of the First World War. So this is just post Blackadder. And of course, Europe's been completely devastated by the First World War, and composers in Europe are really sort of turning their back on tradition, and they're looking towards the new as a way of escaping the old. Also, from an intellectual perspective, music had sort of gone to the end of this sort of diatonic road, di diatonic road, and so composers were looking at the next intellectual step. And what they decided they needed to do was that our, we'd been so trained to listen to these diatonic progressions that everything we hear is sort of subjected to this. So they went, OK, the only way we can do that is we've got to be scientific about this. We're going to actually force it not to be diatonic at all. The way they do that is that they give every single note complete equivalence. So the way we do that is very easy, of course. We can just model a what we're going to call a tone row. And I'm just going to jumble up <coughs> modulo 12. 
Okay? So now if we print this, you'll see that we have the tone row, which now has all of the 12 semitones equally distributed. So there's no one note that has any precedence over any other note. So for our uh, next model then, all we're actually going to do is play through this tone row, and this tone row is just going to repeat uh, over and over. So uh, I'll just pass in the uh, tone row here. Um, and that's fine, that's fine. Instrument and a pan. And then I'm just going to rotate the list one element at a time. So we're just going to go through the list and we'll just keep rotating around. Uh, this will rotate the pitch list, got that. And then the last thing I'm going to do is add an offset. Uh, and that's just an offset to the pitch. So we'll add this to the pitch. And of course we need inst pan. And duration. Okay, so now we're going to start this playing on a flute. So I'm going to need, uh, well, we'll start with our tone row is the first argument, of course. Uh, yeah. And then we have the offset. A flute's relatively high in pitch, so we'll start with 72. Um, and the flute, and I'm going to set this slightly to the left, and we'll start this tone row off and playing. And I'm going to play this through just a couple of times because I want you to start hearing the row. It won't take you long to start kind of hearing where it's going. Now I'm going to add a clarinet, which is playing the same tone row on the other channel. Of course, this is a very sort of structured music, and one of the things that's really important to keep in mind is the historical context. So this was an intellectual movement that actually made a lot of sense. It's basically saying, when we get to this end, the end of this sort of diatonic tradition, what's our next step? Where do we go from here? And this is the avant-garde. This is pushing those boundaries and seeing what's next. So what I'm going to do here is, uh, as well, it was then very common to do things like we would invert the row. So if we say 10% of the time, for example, we'll invert uh, the pitch row. Uh, X, uh, pitch row. We'll see if you can pick it when it changes. There change them. Now, of course, it will flip backwards and forwards. Um, but again, uh, we'll finish with that one. But again, a very important part of the Western uh, legacy, basically. Um, and again, this is around starting in the 1920s and really right through to the present day, but particularly up until about the 1950s. Okay, so I'm going to finish our little journey now in the 1970s. And this sort of period then is associated uh, amongst things with minimalism or a style of music called minimalism. And I'm going to really just rip off a piece uh, by um, Steve Reich, which is known as Piano Phase. And one of the reasons I want to play you this example is that it really sort of highlights that in the 20th century, composers started to think very sort of texturally, very timbrally. And this example actually sort of mimics with normal acoustic instruments a tape and the sliding of a tape backwards and forwards because we're going to phase these two instruments in and out over time. So this will be our final model. Let me... Model number six. And we're going to play pitch list. And then I need the second instrument, which is the other phasing part. So this is the offset for the other instrument. We're going to play this through the other channel. And then we need to pass the little riff around that we're going to play, and we need to pass the 
offset around, or it's not the offset, I should say, it's basically the phase. Uh, so the riff will be rotate uh, riff minus one, and for the moment, I'm not gonna do anything with the um, phase, it's just gonna stay fixed. So let's fire up this new model. What we need to do is put in a, uh, a little musical riff, so I'll just uh, put in a little melody here. And again, like I said, we're gonna start the phase at zero. So at the start, the two instruments will be locked. So the two vibraphones will be locked. And the duration, and I'll reset our metronome to be And let's start this model off and running. Oops. Ah. Oh, let's just change it to PS. Okay, now I'm going to, now that you've heard this play a little bit, I'm going to now add the phasing offset. And you're going to hear the two parts move in and out of phase slowly over time. And they're going to produce these kind of interesting, I just kind of want you to listen to the textures as it sort of moves in and out of phase. It's subtle, but, but quite effective. back into phase but shifted out by one so they're now one note out from each other and this will then keep shifting over time for the whole piece so we're kind of close to the end but of course it wouldn't be complete without adding some beats and Steve Reich definitely needs some beats so let's just add a few beats to this now <laughs> 
the very last thing I kind of want to um, quickly mention is that I was sort of talking uh, about this sort of ability to play in the real physical world. So everything I've been talking about today has all been about scales and notes and chords and these sort of higher level musical structures. But uh, the programming language here, the environment extempore that I've been working with, uh, it allows us to make changes all the way down to the metal. So I just want to leave you with a little bit of a thought about what this talk next time might be if we do a history of digital signal processing. Okay? So let me just uh, start this up again. This model six. And now while this is running, I'm going to jump across to the definition of this FM synthesizer. Okay, so if I flick across now to instruments, we have this uh, FM synth here. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm actually just going to modulate the signal, basically just so that you can hear that I'm actually recompiling this synthesizer on the fly. So if we jump down here and we add this oscillator in, and we'll say something like this, I'll connect this up. There's actually going to be a bit of a lurch here. Don't worry about it. Um, so I'll compile this in. Okay, so this is a ridiculously large modulation, but the point is it's just to show that this is actually changing the audio signal processing chain on the fly, and we're compiling this uh, on the fly. Of course, we could do something like uh, also change the oscillator. So at the moment, this O3 that we're using it is an oscillator. Um, and we can just as easily change that. So if I jump over to the oscillator here, we could double the frequency of all of the oscillators in the system in one go. Maybe not a great idea, but uh, it's just for example. Oh, connect it up again. Okay, and so now again, it's flicked up. So one of the things about this environment uh, is that it's... is that it's been designed from the ground up basically to allow sort of hot swapping of code right down to the metal. Uh, and that's part of this sort of thing about working in the physical environment uh, in what I like to sort of think of as cyber physical systems contexts. So uh, on that note, I think I'm done. Thank you very much. <laughs>